Okay, so welcome if you are just joining us. My name's Bryony. Um, I'm working the marketing team at McGraw Hill. Um, so the event today, we're going to be looking at motivation and engagement, uh, strategies for student success. Um, we have two wonderful speakers for you today and also two of my colleagues who will be in discussion with them shortly. Um, I will get them all uh, panel to introduce themselves very shortly, but I just wanted to run through a, a couple of quick housekeeping notes, if you don't mind, at the beginning. So first of all, um, here's a quick agenda for you today. Um, so this is the welcome and introduction. We'll then be doing speaker introductions. We'll then be moving into our discussion on student motivation, which will take around about 30 minutes. And then at the end, we would love you to join in um, to our Q&A session. So if you're listening along and you have a question, um, please do pop that in the Q&A box and we'll get to those at the end of our discussion. In terms of the webinar, um, we're having a Zoom meeting today, a Zoom webinar. I'm sure you've probably attended many of these since we've all been working online for a couple of years, but um, just in case, please make sure you're connected. You should be able to hear and, um, and see all of your speakers, your panel. Um, you won't be able to turn on your own camera or speakers and attendee because this is um, being uh, run as a broadcast webinar. Um, please make sure you close down anything on your computer that's taking up a lot of capacity, such as Netflix or YouTube, to get the best experience. And as you can see, the session is being recorded and we will be sharing the recording after the session um, in case anyone would like to watch it back um, or would share it with any of their colleagues. Please feel free to do that. Um, yeah, please ask questions as we go. If you want to make comments, please use the chat box for that purpose. Um, we have two wonderful speakers today. Um, as I mentioned, my two colleagues, Rachel and Ros, will also be... Um, interviewing our two speakers. So I'm going to ask them in turn to introduce themselves. Um, actually, if I get my colleagues to go first, if you don't mind, um, Rachel, do you want to just mention quickly who you are and what your role is today? Yeah, hi everyone. And again, thank you for joining us today. My name is Rachel Gold and I work in the international marketing team at McGraw Hill. Wonderful, and Roz? Hi, um, I'm Roz and I'm a product marketing manager um, for business and economics. Um, and I was involved um, in writing some of the case studies um, and the white paper that this webinar is based on. Um, so I'm um, great to be here today and thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Alejandra, could I invite you to introduce yourself, please? Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Alejandra Ramos. I'm a professor of economics at Trinity College Dublin. Um, I conduct research in several topics, but mainly I'm an applied microeconomics uh, and my main interest is in gender, family and household decision making. But of course, I am also teaching and I teach almost all of the quants in our department. So I'm teaching a stats for the first year, mathematical economics for third years, uh, advanced econometric fourth year um, and other courses. But I will share my experience in teaching uh, later on throughout the seminar. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And our second speaker, um, Dr. Dono Palchich, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in economics in the University of Limerick in Ireland. Um, my main area of research is really around infrastructure policy. And in terms of um, my teaching, um, I kind of teach most of the introductory micro and intermediate micro to our first and second year um, business students. So they're very, very large classes, we tend to be five to 600 students in a, in a class. And I also teach uh, public finance that kind of uh, fourth year bachelor and master level. Wonderful, thank you very much indeed. Okay, just to give a bit of context, so this uh, webinar has come about um, because we've had a lot of success with instructors in Ireland that have been using some of our ed tech tools. Um, and we found that they've been getting some really positive feedback from their students. We've created a couple of case studies out of that and also a white paper. And then this webinar has really been born from those conversations that we've had with those instructors. We thought it might be nice to have an opportunity to actually share some of those success stories with you and some of those learnings. So that's why we're here today. Um, I'm going to hand over now to, uh, to my colleague, Wes, who I think is going to put the first question to our speakers. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bryony. Um, and welcome, Donal and Alejandra. So um, both of you have been using EdTech um, in your teaching for quite a number of years now. So even before the pandemic brought it to the forefront uh, for many other instructors. Um, so would you be able to tell us a little bit more about what interested you in EdTech? What brought you to it in the first place? And if I could go first to Alejandra, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, so let me tell you a little bit of my journey. I started in Trinity in 2017, and when I started, I was receiving stats, which is a 400 student course for students of political science, economics, philosophy, and sociology. So it was very diverse. The previous lecturer was using Connect for continuous assessment, 
and I was approached by McGraw Hill with the option of having uh, the smart book. Uh, it was originally an environmental choice saying, well, if they are already using this for quizzes and I can have a PDF version of the book, uh, we minimize printing, why not? Let's engage with that. Uh, but then I started learning about the resources uh, and I decided that part of the issues that I wanted to do or the issue that I wanted to address was to promote student learning and good study habits from the beginning. So I find out that uh, the system had a uh, smart book. So it was not just the PDF version of the book, but a highlighted version of it. Uh, so I decided to change a little bit what it has been done and design things to maximize my time to interact with the students, but minimizing my effort. So I introduce pre-readings. Um, so I give a students marks for reading before the class. Uh, then we keep doing the continuous assessment. So weekly quizzes that the previous lecturer was running as well as uh, weekly homeworks. And I also introduce the uh, midterm exam and all of that was run con through Connect. So that gave me around 40% of the final mark of the course was just from continuous assessment. Um, and that year it worked quite well. Uh, but then when I chat with the students about how to work for them, they said, well, actually sometimes you are repeating yourself because we do read before the class because you, you make us read. Um, and we, we feel it will be better to use the time for examples. And I started thinking about introducing then a flipped classroom uh, because the students already read the material. So I was not building the concepts from scratch. Uh, and through two or I would say in two years that I had a little bit better understanding of what type of examples and what was the level of engagement. Uh, I managed to introduce a flipped classroom. So we have two lectures every week. In one of the lectures, I just deliver the content and we go through the concepts and make sure that everything is clear. But then the next session is a flipped classroom in where we run examples all together. So I just present example, give them some time. I'll go around the room uh, with one of my TAs and make sure that they are uh, given a try. And then they really understand what is the concept for. And I can have a better sense of um, the elements that are more difficult for the class. And I think that has translated into better inclusion. Uh, two reasons is one, because now that I interact closer with the students during the lecture, I have a better sense of where are the key points that I need to address in the lecture. But also we have a better interaction. So they feel more confident in, in telling me this is clear, this is not. Uh, can you include this example? Uh, but also I have come to realize that it's it, it helps for different modes of learning. You know, all of the students are going to respond equally to a weekly quiz or to a homework. So the fact that I diversify and I give them the opportunity to show their learning before the lecture, in the lecture, and in the quizzes, as well as in the homework, I think it has improved the inclusion of the class. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, and Donal, over to you. What, what was your motivation? Um, so I started lecturing um, back in about 2006, but it was about 2011 when I got handed teaching first year microeconomics, um, which is a really large class. And um, I suppose why I started using EdTech was you, you had a, basically five, 600 students in a huge concert hall. They've only just come out of secondary school where they're 25 to 30 students, a teacher who knows their name and is on top of them um, versus me not knowing their name, not knowing anything about them. And uh, they're obviously kind of thrown into the deep end. So I think at the beginning, I just started to have continuous assessment, a bit like anyone else. I was using different platforms to try and do weekly quizzes, but not much else. Then there was maybe um, adding on readings and ebooks. Um, but when I started looking at the stats, I could see students were, you know, maybe 10, 20 percent of students were reading them and 80 percent of them weren't. So there, were, there was really very little engagement with the platform other than doing your tests. And whatever you had to do just to get to get uh, to get through the module um, and it's only in about the last since about 2018 that i've been using connecting a, a, a bit like uh, um alejandro was saying the, the the smart book reading was the big thing for me where you could assign a a, a reading they had to, to they have to complete it uh, and i was able to structure it into the teaching where you could really see the engagements uh, go up and you can 
obviously look at all the uh, the activity reports and identify um, students that maybe aren't engaging and kind of uh, reach out to them. But it's almost automated in that you can you can you can do a kind of a mass email that look personal to them. Um, but it, it's pretty easy then to kind of uh, to get in touch with students that maybe aren't engaged and maybe feeling a bit lost because um, they're in a in a huge kind of classroom and um, it's a difficult transition. So that's been my kind of journey, just gradually over time, layering on myself as I learn different bits and pieces and how to better use the systems and how to better structure things um, compared to maybe 10 years ago when I was just literally using it as a tool to, to do a few tests and that was it. Sure, sure. Thank you. So it sounds that both of you have come at it for similar reasons, really. And it's about it's about um, sort of speaking to the giving students the tools that, that will really help them. Um, so, and, and engaging modern students, I guess, because you know we, students are evolving in the same way that, that the world is evolving all around us all the time. Um, how, what do you think that, that sort of today's students kind of maybe need from instructors, or you know, is there a, do you need to sort of teach differently or do different things to, to appeal to today's audience of students? Sorry, uh, to Alejandra. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Um, so let me talk about the students today, post-pandemic or in the middle of the pandemic. I still don't know where we are. Uh, but I think the students need a structure uh, and they need interactions. Those are my, my two ideas that they need. Uh, I agree with Donald that they come from high school uh, and at the beginning for them, it's always difficult to understand the do's and the don'ts. Uh, what is a good study habit? They have absolutely no idea. And I guess as lecturers, we kind of expect them to know, uh, and they don't. And I think by, by rewarding their effort and making explicit recognition of that knowledge, it also makes them feel valuable. And, and that sense of, I am one in 600, at least if I show here the effort, um, I will be rewarded. I think that's good. But the other thing um, is just for them, it's hard to engage with content that they don't find relatable. So I guess when I was in my undergrad, um, it was an issue of, well, this is the material you have to learn it. These are the formulas and that's it. Um, nowadays, the students expect a little bit more. They want to see live applications of what they are learning. And that is the first instance in my case uh, that if I open the door, then they engage in learning just by presenting this is the solution concept uh, and this is what you are expected to learn. It's very difficult for them to click. Um, they also have limited the span of attention relative to my previous years. Um, so it, it's for me, it's very important for their learning to keep them engaging and having the one to one conversations with them. Um, it's it's key. I think that's one of the of the big difference. But also, it's not only a cost. I think for, for them, it's just okay. I Google it. I, I look for it in YouTube and so on. Um, one of the things that, for instance, I discovered this year was that they did not know Excel, which I was expecting teaching stats uh, that they know how to compute a mean. And I, I find out after I have designed the assessment. This was new, but on the other hand, uh, well, I said literally, these are some resources. Here are some guides that you could use. And then that was it. So I guess, yes, they have, they are a little bit less autonomous in their learning, but once you point them in the right direction, they are easily able to adjust and absorb uh, the, the content that is delivered through technology. Uh, back in the day, I don't think my generation would have been able to do that. And Donald, does that sound familiar to you? Is that similar to what you're seeing? Yeah, no, really similar. I mean, whether it's pre-pandemic or or during or post, uh, hopefully post, um, structure has always been what I've found is the, is the biggest thing, particularly for first and second year kind of students who need to get into good habits. So um, I, I think you kind of have to be really upfront with students and you know say, this is how we're going to do things um, the whole way through the semester. You'll have your different kind of uh, whether it's obviously they've got their lectures, they'll have tutorials, they'll have the different tests, the, the readings, the 
but if you can kind of tell them how it's all pieced together and why you're doing all of that but the main thing is feedback like again when i first started that i wouldn't have been brilliant maybe very consistent about giving feedback they'd have the tests and you might tell the tas yeah that they had a problem with that or you know go go back over that they seem to have an issue with that whereas i've become far more systematic now with just structuring it as best as i can making sure that they constantly get reinforced this is exactly what we're doing and why the real world examples are massive i mean i can remember when i was being taught mike reckon it's not everyone's favorite subject it's uh graphs demand supply you kind of fall asleep um whereas now i think that the more applied you can make it they have to have the bit obviously a bit of the theory you can't avoid all of those things some of the equations but like alejandro was saying the applied real world examples and kind of making it real for them as well as i think constant feedback particularly in a really if you're whether it's a small group or, anyway, or a large group but particularly for a large group that they feel like somebody is actually monitoring them that somebody cares and that they uh, are actually getting feedback rather than just being an absolute face in the crowd and especially these days with like for the last two years i've had to be teaching online um maybe next autumn when i teach those modules we'll be back face to face but the attention span was i can see exactly how many seconds each student has watched and uh, you can really see people switching off so even more so getting them to engage outside of um the lecture um if they're online lectures was a huge thing um to try and make sure that they were still staying engaged um because prior to the pandemic maybe it's a captive audience when they're in front of you for 50 minutes or or for two hours but when it's online it's uh, harder to get them to engage yeah yeah i bet thank you for that donal and if i can hand over to rachel now with another sure question. thanks well i am um, i'm fascinated to hear the story so far and the kind of challenges in the background to you you know changing the way you teach and utilizing ed tech um, Alejandra, I'm, I'm, I'm just wanting to ask you actually um, on the subject of feedback, I know from our case study that we partnered on that you actually asked your students for their feedback and, and you got some really interesting insights. So I thought just while we're on the topic of feedback, maybe you could share, share what you found. Um, yeah, so I, the thing I always say is that the best way to improve the course is just talk to your students. Like they have been guiding me throughout the entire journey. Uh, they said, you are repeating yourself. I introduce a flip classroom. They say, I need more examples. Uh, I introduce more. Um, I guess the way to introduce the feedback for me, it has to be, there are three things that I, I, I normally do. First, um, I need to get everybody on board, uh, interacting early on with the platform, because otherwise um, it's going to be too diverse and I'm going to lose part of the class. And then I don't know if the feedback is really because they are engaging or they are just not participating. Second, um, from day one, when we do the flip classroom, I make sure that they know that this is a safe space. Uh, I did At the beginning, I was not aware of how important this is for them but make an explicit recognition that this is a safe space, that uh, they're gonna make mistakes and that's fine because this is a place where they have uh, low stakes. No one is being penalized. Uh, nobody else in the room knows the answer either. Uh, so I think that that also helped them to be more willing to, to tell me what is it that they understand? What is it that they don't? Like they don't. Then uh, in the middle of the term, so we have one thing that is the reading week, which is literally one week where we stop right before them. Whenever I have a new, whenever I change something in the module, I make sure that they tell me whether that's working or not. Uh, I remember in my first or second year, I was using a, a companion platform called Alec. Um, and the students told me, well, this is just too much. We have so many things to do that it's not working. And then I remove it immediately. But having that conversation throughout the term with them, uh, it's very important. I have recently learned as well that in terms of inclusion uh, on the grounds of gender, having um, online responses and anonymous questions, it's easier for the uh, women in the class that was a surprise for me. And I'm thinking um, the other part of the feedback um, that the students have given me, but I also, yeah, 
working groups. I think that was the last one in the last year. They said, well, the homeworks are fun, but sometimes they are too long. Can we just do it in groups? And I said, yes, why not? That's actually better for me. I have to mark, like, well, for my TAs, like, we have to mark less things. So that's where we are in terms of feedback. Um, the latest one as well, it's final assessment, final summative assessment. Because um, from what I do, I, I run almost everything except the homeworks. Uh, I run it through Connect, but then in the final assessment, I still, well, previous years, I still do it paper and pencil. And they kind of raise the issue, but wait a second, we are being evaluated all the time in Connect, and now you are changing the mode of assessment. And that is something that I'm currently working on. Uh, but yeah, just open the conversation, open it anonymously. Uh, it brings most of the students on board and make sure that whatever they say, you actually change it. Because um, then otherwise it doesn't work. Thanks, Alejandra. I remember as well that you um, shared with us um, that they really enjoyed the pre-reading and, and that was actually something they voted as one of their favorite parts of the course. Uh, yeah, in the first year when I introduced it, I have, because I had changed so many things, literally I have like, a, like eight options, like which is the thing of the course that you like the most and the one that you absolutely hate. And to my surprise, like I was like, the pre-readings, they really like it. And I thought that was only like, I did that the first time. And to be honest, I forgot about it because I said they like it, I keep them. And what was it? Uh, last Tuesday, I arrived a little bit earlier to class and I was chatting with the students outside. And one of them came and said, you know what? Actually, I enjoy the pre-readings because uh, it makes me feel that I am a little bit more prepared for the class and it doesn't take that much time. I love the fact that it, it's just highlighted. So I, I was surprised again to, to hear it. Uh, I thought, yeah, I, I take it as a granted after it, I have make it work once. And I liked the way as well that you shared that they typically kind of are doing their online quiz that forms the kind of last part of the structure that you've got. I'd love to dig into as they're doing more pre-reading. So you kind of shared that they kind of get the connections from subject or subject and, and week to week, they're kind of understanding that connection between what they're learning. And I think that's something that really fascinated me. So I guess at the beginning, when they see this, the timeline of the course, they are a little bit overwhelmed because they said, OK, in a single week, there's going to be a point where I have the pre-reading for the next topic, the quiz for two topics before, before and the homework of the current topic. Um, we're going to become crazy, but then they understand that because, and this is something that's particular to my subject, um, it's cumulative. Um, they, they are able to make the links, so they know that they cannot answer the homework without having revised the previous topic. So in that sense, the quiz is useful. Uh, sometimes I even take some questions of the quiz and put it back in the homework of the next week so that they get the chance to, to reinforce it. Uh, and in the flipped classroom, we end up doing something uh, as well that links to the, the quiz examples, perhaps with the different wording. Uh, so no, I, I really think um, the fact that they see how they are building the knowledge and they feel more and more comfortable with their own ability to learn, it's meaningful for them and, and it boosts their confidence in mastering the subject. That's great. And Daniel, does that sound sim similar to, to your setup with pre-readings and quizzes and lectures and so on? How does it work for you? Um, in, well, in the last two years, there hasn't been any kind of interaction, you know, it's because they're, they're actually even pre-recorded videos um, um, because of the size of the class. But um, I assign the reading in the same week as the, as the lecture content. So it's not pre-reading, but they always have a tutorial the following week based on the previous week's uh, content with the, with the team of TAs that I have. So it kind of really builds up to that and what they do in tutorials to, it assumes obviously that they've, they've had a lecture and done the reading. Um, and then the following week, there's a, a quiz. So it sounds very similar to Alejandro in, in, in terms of the sequence. Uh, one thing I definitely, from feedback was a bit like Alejandro was saying, there's so many different things that they might have to do that it was a simple thing to add, but on our VLE, I could just add a, a checklist. Each week, there's a, a folder for what's the lectures that week and any of the kind of things that they have to get done. And I literally have a checklist saying, obviously, in, in, in the last years, watch the lecture videos for this week. Here's the assigned reading that you have to do. Here's the problem set for your tutorials or whatever for next week. Here's a homework assignment you might have to do. 
and uh, a lot of them came back immediately saying that was brilliant because they just couldn't, you know, until they got used to the system of what happened week by week. And even um, later in the semester, they really went off the checklists and it made a big difference just so that they could stay on top of things. Um, but any feedback I've gotten, I mean, we have to do evaluations all the time. They're kind of uh, obligatory in my university. And the, the qualitative comments that you get often mention that platform. And sometimes I meet some of the students around when they're in their next semester doing macroeconomics. And um, they've often said, I wish there was the same, you know, it's a different module leader, but I wish there was the same type of approach um, in terms of uh, the structure with the online engagement uh, and then the, the lecture resources. That's that's great to hear. And can you just share for the people who aren't um, as familiar as us, um, just how you set up your course with your, you know, your readings and the tests and, and the allocation of grade and so on? Yeah, so the first time I used, so that smart book, which is the, the, um, the uh, on the Connect platform, and, and you can assign a reading, you can even assign a very specific part of a chapter, they don't have to read the entire chapter. It's, I, I get to choose subsections of the chapter that they have to read. Um, the first time I, I, I used it, a similar an issue, like I, I didn't make any, I didn't give any marks for the, you know, it was just, it's assigned and yet you, you were expected to do it and I wasn't seeing huge engagement. So what I did the following year was they have a number of online tests that count towards 30% uh, of their grade during the semester before their final exam. Um, I gave a reading every single week and that, that became a waiting for their results for the continuous assessment. So if you did, let's say all 10 readings and you answered all of the questions and you got a 100% completion rate, if you got 25 out of 30% in your continuous assess assessment, you got that 25%. If you only did half your readings, you got half that. If you did no readings, you got nothing. Um, so they very quickly figured out that they had to do the readings, but at the same time, it didn't take them long to see that because of the way I structured it, the readings they were being given were exactly what they needed to do to prep for each of those tests. It actually helped them um, do better in those tests. And uh, then I saw the engagement go you know, um, to a very, very high level and the different reports you can get and connect, you know, the at-risk report and things. But usually the, in the past, I would have had a lot of people in the orange and red saying they're not engaging, whereas now it was nearly all green and maybe some to keep a watch on. And it saw a complete and utter change just with a fairly simple kind of change in the structure and maybe make a bit of a the stick approach in terms of you, you have to complete this, otherwise you're going to be penalised. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. Great. Um, thank you both. Um, so I think, Dana, you've kind of touched there slightly on what my, what my next question was going to be. So it was going to be around, I know both of you have, um, have said to us previously, you feel quite strongly that, um, that using EdTech and Connect uh, as well has um, enhanced outcomes for your students. Um, and you've both mentioned in the past that the added structure that Connect provides is, is a big part of that. And the fact that it gets them to sort of paces their learning um, a little bit so they're not just cramming ahead of um, ahead of formative assessments, a uh, summative assessment, sorry. Um, and I, so I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit um, on sort of how you're uh, getting the, your students to engage with that and describe what you found to be most um, impactful and useful in terms of engaging students. And um, so Dona, you've you just mentioned the fact that actually you've, you've wrapped that into grade. Um, and you know, perhaps uh, you might want to talk a little bit more about that. I don't know. Um, is there is there anything more that you would want to say about that? Yeah, I mean, that that you know, it really was kind of learning by doing, but on my part, uh, in terms of um, trying to get the the assigned readings right, that, that that was a big part of it. And uh, you can you can see the engagement jump, but outside of that, you can give them other types of application based activities. Um, so whether it's uh, an algorithmic graphing question that everyone gets a different uh, type of thing. I'd, I'd often have lots of other mini assignments around those, around the reading, or you know, it could be a simulation or even other kind of, um, it could be just uh, an assigned reading on, on something real world. Uh, you know, so 
there's your stuff in the book chapter. Now here's an example, maybe in the Irish or European economy that's directly related to this. So never going too crazy because you don't want to give them too much to do, but always that, those little add-ons, I think, um, which don't count towards their grade, but I was actually seeing that a lot of them were doing it. I, sometimes I think that they, they think everything is going to count and they're just going to do it. And I'm not going to tell them that it doesn't because it suits yeah. me if they all do it. But um, I, I, I think that they, because of the assigned readings counting, uh, because obviously their tests count and all of that, that they think that everything they're assigned um, actually all counts, which suits me, as I said. And uh, layering on those little extras without going too crazy, um, I, I think really benefited them rather than just, there's a reading, there's a test. And, and that's kind of it, like uh, a bit like Alejandro was talking about earlier. The, the more applied you can make it, uh, the more you're going to engage them because I, I'm, I, you know, in my case, I'm teaching 650 students that are doing business. Maybe 80 or 90% of them won't specialize in economics. Um, it's not really going to be something they're madly interested in. But if you can, if you can get their interest early on and show, um, you, you know, that there's a lot of real world applications that no matter what you specialize in afterwards, it's going to help you. Um, I, I think they kind of, uh, they enjoy that. That's great. Thanks, Daniel. And, and same question to you then, Alejandra. Ren. What would you say has been the most useful and most impactful in terms of engaging students? I, I, I'm going to say two things, because again, one okay. is going to be very different. And uh, both agree with Donald. So I think first is the structure. Um, I, it is important to devote time to organize the model and to explain clearly to the students where it said that they are, what is it that they are supposed to do and how that contributes towards their final mark. At the end, uh, at the beginning, that's the only outcome that students care um, about. So I just, as an example, uh, first week I said, we're going to use this platform, it's used for all continuous assessment. Well, that doesn't tell them anything unless you tell that 10% of the mark is coming from pre-readings. Pre-readings are every week. If you complete it before the lecture, you get one point out of the hundred of the final mark. If you don't complete it, well, that's it. No excuse. Same thing with the homework, same thing with the quizzes. Uh, and given that a structure uh, from the beginning sets the right expectations, gives them an accurate framework of where to put their effort, um, it also minimizes emails, which is super daunting with such large number of students. So the rules of the game are clear from the beginning. We also have similar to Donal, uh, an Excel or PDF file where it says what is due every day of the week for the entire term. Uh, and then whenever we receive a question is please refer to the Q&A or please refer to this document. Uh, but the second thing it's adapting the content to the students. Every cohort is different. Uh, They're going to have different interests, but throughout the years, uh, I think uh, there, there are a set of examples that are meaningful for them. Um, so I would say uh, engagement works when the students can link to the material. That is a bit of extra work for us, but it also makes it fun. No, we don't want to keep the subject up there in the nebulous. Um, so yeah, th those are the two things, clear structure and open communication so that they can tell you what matters and what's meaningful and then actually translate that into, into examples and applications. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and just quickly before we move on to Q&A, because I think we've got a couple there in the chat. Um, in terms of, a sort of, I think you mentioned, Donal, about engagement and the, the, the reporting that you get through Connect. Um, and when we spoke before for the case study, you were saying that you'd seen some really good um, leaps in engagement uh, with the online stuff. Would you just be able to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so... Um... The, on the Connect platform, the, there's different reports you can get in terms of activity. The, the at-risk report is one where it's it's basically looking at everybody's engagement with everything from the readings to their assessment, uh, kind of a composite indicator. And uh, the class are all graded almost from the most engaged, the most engaged student on, in, in, in the entire class all the way to the least engaged. But that's really useful for seeing who's in the red in that they're just not engaging at all. Um, and then you can actually, on the system, just email those stu uh, uh, students and say, is there something up? Do you need extra resources? We often put on extra support tutorials. I might even give some of those support, uh, support tutorials myself, you know, 
you know, some of the times you're not going to get the students is not going to engage and that that's something that's going on with the student and the, and uh, for whatever reason it might be but you often i often see anyway a lot of students saying actually uh, i am finding it really hard or you put on those extra classes and uh, look i think there's, there's no question that they benefit from that um in terms of they see someone cares someone's watching and uh the the uh they it's up to them then to to try and avail of that extra support and to engage more for the other students um you know the ones that are, are engaging it's still important to to not ignore them um you know so I, I often do put up some of the stats or particularly when it comes to assessment um provide the feedback uh have kind of these days it's been online but live q a sessions where anyone can can connect uh, can connect and talk to me um and even I think there's a on our VLE, I have a, a forum and you can post anonymously. Um, so it's moderated as well, just in case somebody puts up something they shouldn't put up. But um, I think some students, like Alejandro was saying, that don't want to maybe go on a Q&A and have their ask something uh, and, see, and someone can see their name, have that forum there. And it's often been really useful where someone, you know, you know someone might ask something or then another 10 students go, yeah, I have the exact same thing. I don't know anything about that. There are small little things uh, that I've just added on over time. And that was even pre-COVID. It wasn't to do with uh, um, COVID. It was more just trying to engage students outside of the classroom um, because it's so big that it's very, very hard for them to even meet each other um, and uh, engage with me. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Donal. And Alejandro, did you have anything that you would like to add to that? Or does Donal pretty much summarized it <laughs> no i think donald just summarized it brilliant that's wonderful uh, if i could just uh pass back over to Bryony then um to have a look at some of the queue the questions that have popped up in the chat wonderful yes thank you so much i have to say the discussion has really got the chat going and people have come up with quite a number of questions so i just was hoping i could pop a couple of those to our panel if possible please um one of those that came up very early and was really how are you getting your students to actually access the platform? So you've mentioned that you're using the Connect platform on your course. Are you providing this through your institution or are students somehow purchasing that for themselves? Um, Do you want to go first? Okay, so um, I, I was trying to figure out who was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, no, so I don't get it through my institution. In fact, the students uh, are registering for Connect themselves. Uh, the way to do it is uh, first, like, sure, I explained the rules. I said, this is where it's going to happen. This is the link. Uh, because they were previously paying already for the platform, um, for the quizzes, there has not been much complaints, also because it includes the book. So when they make a comparison of the price of the physical book uh, with the price of the platform, um, I think they are more than okay with it. Um, that happens probably in the first week, uh, as Donald said, I, I, oh no, one thing that I do is I ask them to register, not with the name and last name, but with their student number and with the email address of the university. Uh, and that enables me to do super easy the match with my student list. So I can really see who is not. And then I email them immediately, uh, week two hey, how are you? You're not in platform. What's going on? Uh, I do ask for a couple of free codes uh, for McGraw Hill because there are students that are genuinely in financial difficulties. We have never, never exceed uh, more than, I would say, 10 in the entire term. And these are uh, genuine cases. Um, so just for you to know, this year I have 381 students by week like after the first lecture that was on a Tuesday, I have 70 right after the end of the lecture. That Sunday, I had 270 students. After, right, like after the deadline of the first pre-reading, we were at um, 360. So there were just 20 students that were not engaging. And it was very easy to identify them and, and follow up with them. So it is not run through central administration, but I did have to ask authorization uh, beforehand to make sure that they were okay with me using this platform. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Dana? Yeah, so um, I'm lucky enough in that 
because I'm first up with my first year microeconomics in a sequence of modules that they take before they choose a specialization. Um, they get micro autumn, then macro in the spring, and then an intermediate one in the second year in the autumn. Uh, and I teach the intermediate one. So it's easier for me because I can get them to, uh, to purchase access to the book and everything on Connect, um, but they get three semesters worth of access. Yeah, it's the same resource for three, three full semesters. And it was a, it's an easier sell job then because previously you did different module leaders assigning different things and it'd be quite expensive for students over time. Whereas now this is, and they're kind of told you're going to get three semesters worth of uh, use out of this. And uh, luckily my colleague um, in, the, in the kind of middle semester there uh, also jumped on the, the same thing. You know, we often have to coordinate that way institutionally i didn't need any kind of uh, we're kind of fairly independent like you um i think a, if there was a big issue obviously um uh, maybe a, a head of department or dean would be made aware of it and, and something would happen but um it's it's a uh, it's i think three out of my uh three of my colleagues in the autumn semester are all now on on, on connect out of five modules so it's becoming uh you know quite established they've seen i started with it and then they've kind of joined on particularly for those first year modules where it's just a numbers game until they choose a specialization. It's huge. Mm -hmm. And then it'll all, you know, go down to smaller classes. Right. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. Um, one other question that we had was what advice would you consider giving to someone who is perhaps thinking of exploring Connect for the first time? Where would they get started? Alejandro, would you like to take that first? Um, I would say to take the time to set up the course. There is a, I'm not going to say that it's small, there is a non-trivial uh, setup cost, but it's something that you literally don't have to touch again uh, throughout the years. Um, and when you're doing so, I would say uh, you have to think first in the structure that you want to have. You want to have it by week or do you want to organize by topic? So just have that clear in your mind and have this sort of Excel with which are all of the activities that you want to happen, map them in Connect. And when designing the quizzes, don't be like me, be smart and make algorithmic <laughs> questions from the beginning. Because at the beginning, I heard this thing, algorithmic questions, and I have no idea what that is. I'm just going to create my quizzes. And then like afterwards, I'm like, what is this algorithmic question? And I realized that it was just the same exercise with different numbers. And I'm like, oh, this is way better for, <laughs> copying uh, and plagiarism issues. So I, I set that up, I, I just changed the questions. Uh, but since I do that, I just need to bring every year, I just literally copy the same thing. So there is a minor uh, adjustment of the dates is if first I'm teaching on the Hillary term on the Michaelmas term of their different times of the year. But apart from that, there is minimal cost in, in setting up the platform and adjustment things. Um, that's probably, uh, number one. And I would say the thing that I didn't do, and I think I, I would have liked to do for is play a little bit with the platform because there are a couple of resources that are available. Uh, I was given the example this year of Excel uh, that I didn't know that my students were absolutely clueless about it uh, for several reasons. Maybe when they finish uh, high school, there was the pandemic, they had no chance. Uh, but then I realized that there is this media component in where the students have videos step by step almost every single thing they can do in excel i didn't know that and well exposed that was a good surprise but uh, i think before starting to decide what is it that i want them to do or not i think just having a an overview of what are the resources available uh, and yeah make sure to map that on the continuous assessment because if it's not rewarded uh, it's hard to make the change fantastic advice there thank you and dono yeah, no, similar enough to Alejandra. I mean, I like teaching that the module I've been teaching for a long time. Sometimes you can get set, you know, changing textbook is a big thing in terms of they're all slightly different. You might have a different the, the way you structure your lectures and topics, your own set of slides. You know, sometimes you look at it and oh, I don't know, am I gonna go to all this hassle, blow everything up and uh, start with a new platform, try and figure it out. Um so having Playing around with it a lot, um, uh, as Alejandro said, is the biggest thing. And then thinking about how you're going to structure it. Because my first year or two, 
I probably wasn't structuring well. Like I said, I, I didn't have marks to the assigned readings. Kind of didn't know. Someone mentioned ABAs or something. I was like, well, no idea what an ABA is or really application-based activity. Kind of ignored all that. Just wanted to get everything kind of up and running. And when you're dealing with that many students on the volume of emails, you, you know, you can get distracted. Whereas if I could go back in time, I probably would have preferred to spend a bit more time figuring out the exact structure I was going to use um, and rather than just learning from your mistakes uh, over time. That, that's the best thing I could like, look at the full functionality of everything and then think about how would I then structure that throughout the semester and uh, how would I have everything kind of feed into a grade or which bits are going to be for, not forced upon students, but that, that they have to engage and which bits are going to be the add-ons. Um, mm -hmm. They're just things I figured out over time. I suppose that's natural enough, but if you can, trying to plan a, a kind of very good structure from the beginning um, would be the best way uh, in, in terms of uh, an approach, I think. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm sure that would have been an extremely helpful advice to those listening. I'm afraid we do have, have a lack of time now for taking any more questions. We're, um, we're up 45 minutes already, it's flown by. Um, we do have one or two more things that have, have come in. Um, so we may try and answer those later when we do the follow up to this session. Uh, I'd just like to close there by thanking very much our speakers. Thank you, Alejandra, and thank you, Donald, for your contribution today. Thank you to Rachel and Ros as well for putting the questions, and thank you to everyone that's attended. Uh, we will be following up with a recording of this session. We're get, also going to circulate um, the case studies we mentioned at the beginning of the event and also the white paper. So if you'd like to do a bit more reading and find out a bit more about how other people are using these tools, then please do that. Um, also, do reach out to us if you'd like to have a one-to-one -one conversation or just find out a bit more about how Connect works. We'd be delighted to speak to you. So. Thank you once again to everybody for attending today, and I hope you have a successful rest of the week. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks to Donal and Alejandra. No worries. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you so much.